الظلام أو الأوستيوبروزيس أو is known أو حشاشة العظام is known uh, long time ago um, يعني before إسلام uh, that وهن العظام أو حشاشة العظام is, is a disease but nobody knows today that how is this disease and how we can prevent this disease. So I will give you the, the, the insight from our view of surgeons. Uh, what is an osteoporosis? As all of us knows, you know, it's a low bone mass. Uh, the microarchitecture deterioration of the bone tissue resulting to an increase in bone fragility and fracture. As you can see between one and two, this is the normal uh, structure and mass of the, of the vertebra. And the other one is a collapsed vertebra with an osteoporotic. And we can see it in elderly patients, particularly in female. When they get elder, they get uh, smaller because of the uh, mass of the, of the deterioration and uh, uh, the loss of the bone mass in their body. So osteoporosis at the hip and spine affects almost 49 million adults ranging between 9 to 38% and in women much more in 1 to 8%, uh, sorry, in, in women and in, in men about 1 to 8%. So female are more affected by the osteoporosis. Next. And if we can go to the most of the common uh, osteoporotic and uh, <clears throat> in the Saudi guidelines, we can see that the lifestyle factors, when it comes to low calcium, when it comes to immobilization, vitamin D uh, inefficiency, smoking, and alcohol abuse, this is a lifestyle affecting the bone marrow and leading to osteoporotic. Genetic factors like uh, cystic fibrosis, Marfan syndrome, and osteogenesis imperfecta, this can lead also to I'm just mentioning the most known uh, causes that can uh, lead to osteoporosis. The, when it comes to endocrine disorders, uh, diabetes, which is very high in Saudi Arabia, Cushing syndrome, uh, thyroid toxosis, and hyperparathyroidism can also lead to osteoporosis. In the gastrointestinal disorders like the celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease on, or, or pediatric surgery. I have seen so many pediatric, uh, uh, post-pediatric surgery patients that were even not able to walk because they have post-operative uh, osteoporosis. Uh, next one. When it comes to uh, hematological disorders by multiple myeloma, thalassemias, leukemia, sickle cell diseases, rheumatic and uh, autoimmune diseases in ankylosis, spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, and in the central nervous system, uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson, uh, when it comes to miscellaneous conditions and diseases like uh, HIV, uh, COPD, end-stage renal disease, all these congestive heart failure, all these uh, diseases can lead to osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is I call it, it's a hidden cancer. It's a cancer that nobody knows how to manage it. And unless we as a group uh, where the rheumatologist and internal medicine and orthopedic can talk uh, about this and how to manage this disease and this symposium is really a very good uh, first step in this, uh, in this direction. Next. Now, in Saudi Arabia, this is the only study that I have found in 2007 talking about uh, the hip fracture, which is indicating that the, the osteoporosis is still uh, unknown or not really known in the, in the, in the, in the public. Uh, we have from here and there some sporadic talk about osteoporosis, but the awareness of osteoporosis in the public still not uh, so known like diabetes or like heart diseases. So according to this study in 2007, the annual direct cost, only the direct cost of osteoporosis hip fracture can reach up to 2.09 million at a rate of 48,000 real per patients. 
which is very high. This is only a direct cost. We are not talking about the indirect cost, which is the handicapping of the patients and the additional diseases and comorbidity with the osteoporosis. How many people are around helping the patient with osteoporosis in case they are handicapped? So it is not included in this cost. If we include this, the cost of it will reach up to 100,000 real definitely per patients for uh, the, the effects of osteoporosis in the, uh, in, the, in the direct and indirect cost of the, uh, of the osteoporotic patient. Next. So <clears throat> now when we talk about the prevalence of osteoporosis is expected to increase. Why? Because the aging is also increasing. So we, if we take only Saudi Arabia as an example, and in the past, uh, 10 to 15 years, the aging uh, uh, level was in the between the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. Now we are reaching uh, the 70s and 80s. And this uh, increasing of aging uh, is leading definitely to uh, osteoporosis. So we have to increase the awareness of osteoporosis in the society. Uh, it has to be also to mention that vitamin D deficiency is an extremely common among Saudis, more in female than male. Because we are not uh, more, particularly in our society, we are not exposed to sun. Uh, most of us, male and female, uh, because of the heat and the humidity and uh, the high heat and the high temperature, most of the, of the society or the people they don't want to go into the, into the sun. And I'm talking about most of these people doesn't know that the sun does not mean the noon sun. It is in the early morning and in the afternoon sun, which is where the, the, high, uh, the high rate of the violet rays uh, is good for the, uh, for the development of, uh, of uh, vitamin D under the skin. Next. Uh, <clears throat> The best test that we can use for bone, uh, for, uh, for detecting uh, osteoporosis is the DEXA or the uh, BMD. And it is uh, considered as the gold standard for osteoporosis diagnosis from our terms. And the results are definitely known to everybody. Uh, but it is scored by two measures, either the T or the Z score. When it is coming to the minus, next, we can see that uh, in the normal bone, it is from minus one up to one, and then the middle where we can see the, the low bone mass, where we can talk about uh, osteopenia, and above uh, minus 2.5 uh, or below 2.5, uh, below minus 2.5, we are talking about a definite uh, osteoporotic uh, patients. Uh, next. Now, in this slide, you can see the bone quality and aging. And you can see that in female, uh, if you follow the screen, it starts where the, from the 50s and the 60s in the female. And in the male, it is uh, much more. It is coming in the 70s. So our standard should be uh, from 50 to 60 in the female and 70 and above in the, in the male. Next. Now, if we want really to screen uh, patients for detecting osteoporosis, I think we have to screen all women above 40s who have a sustained low trauma fragility fracture. And all women above 60 of age in Saudi Arabia should be screened for osteoporosis. Premature menopause, risk assessment and premenopausal and postmenopausal women who had a risk of fractures, patients who had X-ray findings suggestive of osteoporosis. This we can see, we can see a lot of patients in our clinic having this problem, and they are not, they are not even complaining of osteoporosis, but their X-rays uh, and body uh, aching indicated that they have uh, osteoporosis. 
patients who are beginning to receive long-term uh, glucose uh, steroids therapy or other drugs associated with bone losses, like uh, psycho psychosomatics, uh, psychogenic drugs, are uh, an anti-epileptic drugs can indicate uh, uh, osteoporosis. Adults with primary hyperthyroidism or other diseases or uh, uh, nutritional conditions associated with bone loss, these people or these patients should be really screened for osteoporosis with the BMD. Next. Now, <clears throat> I will just give you some of how much complications of uh, patients we are receiving in our hospital on a, let's say, a weekly basis, more than three to four patients who had complication and osteoporotic fracture due to uh, unknown uh, osteoporosis and complication. I give you the complication of many cases, how we how osteoporosis can lead really to fatal uh, conditions. And this is a 57 uh, uh, years uh, female patients. She's obese. She has history of diabetes, hypertensive, and cabbage three years ago. She is not known, or she does not know that she has osteoporosis. She, she was not treated for osteoporosis. She presented in our ER after following a minimal trauma uh, while she was walking uh, through the carpet, she slipped on the floor and had a severe tenderness when she came to us in the ER of uh, proximal thigh. Next, you could see that on the X-ray when she arrived in the ER, we, she had this fracture. Now, we, from our surgical point of view, we have to proceed with the fixation. Now, you have to know that most of these patients with a lot of comorbidities, we have to really to be aware, and they are going in the high-risk uh, patients because of the multiple uh, comorbidities. Anyway, we have proceeded with the uh, fixations, and this is the next slide will show her post-operative uh, uh, X-ray. It went nice, it was no problem. We had uh, fixed hair with what we call a BFN, proximal femoral nail. The operation itself does not take more than one to two hours. And the patient is well recovered and can start mobilization on the next day. We usually have a routine in such patient because the bone quality is very, uh, very poor and the fixation is very strong. So we, when we discharge the patient, we, we discharge them, all of them on a walker and no weight bearing until we can see uh, a starting callus formation. And additional, we give them a fortu. This is a, a medication that, in the, that induced uh, a calcium uh, deposit in the bone. Uh, next. Now, this patient came back to in the clinic six weeks later on. We asking the patient all the time to follow in a very short period, like two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. And six weeks, she came um, after she in, unintentionally started walking. I have to mention here that most of these patients, a particularly elderly patient, above 60 and 70, they are really not aware of how to wet bear and how to non wet bear. This is the reason we discharge them on the uh, on a wheelchair. But uh, sometimes it happens that they forget and they start walking or standing and few steps. And this can lead to a disaster condition, which is showing in this X-ray. The patients start walking with weight bearing over the surgical site. And then uh, she starts to have this, uh, this condition. That means if you can see the structure of the, of the implants uh, starting to fail. So we had again to go in and reconstruct the, uh, the fracture again. This is another surgical intervention 
with a patient of high morbidity. Next. So we have, uh, next one. Uh, we had to go and, uh, and uh, reconstruct the fracture. You could see we, it was, this, it was not easy to reconstruct uh, this fracture after refracture. So we are talking about morbidity with high risk patients with uh, bone, uh, bad bone quality. So we have put uh, additional bone uh, substitute to enhance the bone uh, formations. It went okay, the patient stayed us. And, but two weeks later or two months later, she started to have infection. As I said, because of the high morbidity, she started to have high SR, CRP, and the wound started also to discharge, plus the obesity she had. So she, come, she came back to us and we could see that again, the implant started to fail. Now we have a big dilemma of this, uh, of this patient. Uh, this patient is still under treatment. We had to remove all the implants again and remove the head. We have, pay, we have to put the patient on antibiotic until the infection is, uh, is subsided. We are now planning the patients again for a third surgery, which is a, a total hip replacement. Now, this is only to give you the how much complication osteoporosis can lead if we don't treat it or we, if, discover, if they are not discovered early. Next. Even when we said, uh, when we said uh, that uh, preventive uh, or preventive measurement can reduce the risk of fracture, but it does not prevent totally the fracture. So we are reducing only the rate of fractures that happen in osteoporotic, uh, osteoporotic patients. So this is the, uh, the, the patient is now uh, under antibiotic uh, treatment for six weeks. And after that, we are planning her for uh, total hip replacement. Just imagine a patient now, she is over uh, one year, not, not mobilized. This is causing again, depression to the patients. So we have another dilemma of, uh, of this depression. Now the case number two, this is a straight uh, forwarded uh, patients, but it has also with osteoporosis and 80% of the patient with fracture, such fracture are osteoporotic patients. This is 62 female. She has also diabetes, hypertensive, comminuted, uh, left uh, treated by trial of close reduction. Next, this is her X-ray as a trial of close reduction, which failed. You could see the radius fracture and, sorry, go back. No, no, yes. The radius fracture, this patient will be disabled if she, if she was left like this. So we had to again um, come in and treat her with the uh, operative measurement. Next, this is her post-operative X-ray. Uh, we have done uh, what we call a radial uh, plating. Uh, again, the patient is discharged uh, with a fortitude, but she is handicapped for at least two to three months until union is achieved. And this is, you could imagine with osteoporotic patients, with elderly patients, how much agony these patients have. Next. The third and last case, is again an osteoporotic fracture, a 77 years male, again with core morbidity, diabetes, hypertensive, and um, high blood pressure with uh, on medications. Uh, he has only a simple uh, fall in the from the while he's uh, trying to 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 uh, to wash himself in the salah. And he fall back on his back and he has sustained this L1 fracture next. And he came to the ER. You could see this is the normal X-ray on the L1. It is not clear with this X-ray, but we have to do a CT scan to show the fracture next. And I didn't, 
Next, you have the CT scan, is it? Yes. You can see on the L1, no, no, go back, please. No, yes. In the L1, you can see it's a, it looks like a very simple fracture. It's not, um, it doesn't, it, it has no neurology. If we leave this fracture with his osteoporotic condition, it will go in kyphosis. So the patient will, will lean forwards and he will get shorter and then he will get neurology. So we have to treat this patient operatively. And we call this operation MIS. It's a minimal invasive because he has 77 years old with high risk for anesthesia. So we had to go with minimal invasive. So these are minor uh, incisions or small incision. We had fixed the fracture. Next. This was his post-operative fracture, perfect reduction, perfect operation. Next day, the patient was discharged, walking. Now he came back, uh, he was doing fine. And, and he was receiving uh, interoperative. The bone was very soft. And so we have to do the Texas scan to, uh, to start the anabolic bone agent because this is one of the requirement of the insurance. They don't allow us to give this or to you until we do the Texas scan. The Texas scan shows that he has a minus two, which is indicated for osteoporosis. Even we have started this uh, treatment with the Forteo, but after um, uh, the test, he came back and we started the Forteo. You could see, next please. He came in follow-up. You could see from the upper screw, there are what we call a pull-out of the screw. Because of the osteoporotic bone, uh, the screw started to pull up. Even the patient was not complaining. He was doing, but you could see that he is now going in kyphosis. The spine is going forwards. We have to monitor these patients because if he starts complaining of the metal, we have to remove it again. Next. Now, <clears throat> in review of all these cases, what I have shown you, there were, I just want to summarize the the risk of such patients, risk factors, diabetic, obese, they are immobilized, they have most monopausal osteoporosis. With minor trauma, they can lead to major complications. Uh, next. And the take home message that I want everybody in this audience and myself also, I'm saying all Saudi women above 60, old, uh, years old and men above 65, they must undergo BMD for assessment uh, using the DEXA. An early diagnosis and lifestyle change is mandatory. And I'm encouraging Dr. Elham uh, to establish an osteoporosis unit in our hospital, including the rheumatologist and the internal medicine and the uh, orthopedic uh, and the gynecology to, <clears throat> to screen our patients and to advise them and to educate them on uh, what is an osteoporosis, what is osteoporosis. And <clears throat> we have to facilitate osteoporosis screening with uh, endocrinology, uh, geriatric, rheumatology, and orthopedic is mandatory approach to disseminate information and prevention of osteoporosis. Thank you very much. And this was my, uh, my last slide. I hope that I did not exceed the time. Thank you everybody and enjoy the, the meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Held, for this nice informative uh, presentation with the presentation of real life cases uh, studies and uh, of your nice work and uh, your skills in orthopedic are shown in this uh, a nice presentation. Thank you very much. And you, you are with us. Uh, we will collect all the questions after uh, uh, the session of Professor Serge and you will be with us. Thank you very much. And thank you for the brilliant idea for making an osteoporotic center, which will collect the all osteoporotic cases starting from pediatric up to adult age. Thank you very much. You're welcome.
You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, now we will shift to the other session, uh, uh, another presentation. Uh, I would like uh, to thank first uh, uh, Amgen uh, Company for uh, encouraging us to make this uh, uh, international uh, symposium. Uh, and I will start my presentation uh, titled uh, Updated Guidelines in uh, Osteoporosis. Hans, you can share the presentation, please. Sure. Okay. No, this is not mine. This is Dr. Sema. Uh, the guidelines of osteoporosis. Yes, yeah, this yeah. one. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد عليه الصلاة والسلام. I will start my presentation entitled Osteoporosis Management Guideline Updates. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, this is uh, uh, where uh, osteoporosis was cited in the Nobel Quran as Dr. Uh, Professor Khalid tell before uh, in Surah Maryam, uh, the, uh, the ayah number three. Uh, so, uh, uh, in Arabic means osteoporosis, uh, which means in, uh, uh, when we translate this word, uh, it means that even any movement, any little movement without trauma will lead to break of bones. This is osteoporosis or the porous bone or the weak bones. Next, please. Uh, my agenda will include an osteoporotic overview, updated guideline for diagnosis, screening of fractures, and follow-up of management, and uh, we will summarize the presentation and conclude. Next, please. Uh, there are uh, some frightening facts. As uh, Professor Khalid said, uh, one in two women over 50 years old will uh, have an osteoporotic uh, fracture. One in four men over 50 years old will have an osteoporotic fracture. In women over uh, 45 years old, they will spend more days as a hospital uh, because of osteoporosis, more than diabetes, heart attack, or breast cancer. And also, uh, due to the un uh, awareness of the bone health, there will be uh, uh, there, there is uh, uh, hip fractures increase incidence on 2020, and uh, in uh, in the USA uh, there is uh, about four, 40 million who are suffering of osteoporosis or fractures, and 25 percent of uh, the people who have hip fractures will die within the first months, first six months after injury. Next, please. Osteoporosis is a silent disease. It is the most common bone disease affecting women. It is silent disease presented as fractures, and there are no specific symptoms, such as back pain, loss of height, a stopped posture, and the bone break even with simple movement. It is a generalized skeletal disorder characterized by uh, decreased density and quality of the bone leading to fracture. Uh, the bone loss is more during the menopausal transition and early menopause, and it occurs also in older men aged 70 years old with a reduced testosterone, sedentary life, poor nutrition, and medication that impair healthy bone turnover. Next, please. The pathophysiology, it is uh, uh, due to uh, uh, variable change in bone remodeling. The osteocytes are master cells in bone remodeling, detect mechanical loading, and regulate the both bone formation by osteoplast and the bone resorption by osteoclast. And so they are the main master cells uh, predisposing to bone remodeling. Next, please. So whenever there is bone loss due to normal age-related changes in bone remodeling, as well as extrinsic and intrinsic factors, that exaggerates this process, bone remodeling has two primary functions, to repair micro damage within the skeleton, to maintain skeletal stress, to supply calcium supply from the skeleton to maintain serum calcium. After age of 30 to 40, which is the peak uh, bone uh, formation, the resorption started 
and formation process become imbalanced, which will lead to osteoporosis. Next, please. Uh, the guidelines of our, uh, uh, were developed by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists uh, in 2020 uh, with the intention of a reduction of risk of related fracture and maintain the quality of life. And they give a clinical tool to help the physician in diagnosis and treatment of osteoporosis. Uh, the guidelines uh, will recommend evaluation of all women aged 50 years old or older for osteoporosis risk. The initial evaluation includes a detailed history, physical examination, and clinical fracture risk assessment with uh, the fracture risk assessment tool. Next, please. So the AACE, or the updated guideline of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, recommends bone mineral death testing in the following patient, women aged 65 years or older, postmenopausal women with a history of fracture without major trauma, or with osteopenia, or starting long-term systemic leukocorticoid. More than three months, and more than the dose must be more than 7.5 milligrams perimenopausal or postmenopausal with risk factor of osteoporosis with a low body mass index, uh, taking long-term systemic leukocorticoid or with a family history of osteoporotic fractures. Next, please. Other indication would be early menopause, current smoking history, excessive consumption of alcohol and caffeine, and secondary osteoporosis. Uh, smoking will affect the calcium absorption and uh, decrease the metabolism of the bone. Also drinking alcohol and the nicotine will affect uh, the uh, bone mineral density leading to osteoporosis. I give a special slide for the soda and osteoporosis because it is a common question asked by many patients. And because of another thing, the free refill effect found in all restaurants in all Arabic countries. Next, please. Soda and osteoporosis, the free refill concept. Whenever we are in a restaurant, we have a free refill of soda and all carbonated beverages. Uh, this uh, drinking soda and carbonated beverages tend to lower the bone density or the amount of bone mineral uh, the bone tissue have. Uh, studies show that among postmenopausal women, for example, Drinking two servings of soft drinks increase the lifetime risk of bone fractures, especially hips. Also in soda drinks or beverages, uh, the phosphoric acid is used to enhance the flavor of soda. They will interfere with calcium absorption and result in loss of bone calcium. Next, please. The diagnosis of osteoporosis uh, will be according to the bone mineral density, a uh, T-score of minus 2.5 or less of the lumbar spine or hip by DEXA, low trauma spine or hip fracture regardless of bone mineral density, the T-score between minus 1 and minus 2.5 and the fragility fracture, a T-score between minus 1 and minus 2.5 with high frac fracture based on a country specific threshold. Next, please. We have uh, many tools to absolute uh, fracture risk calculator. We entered uh, all the information regarding the age, the height, the weight, the bone mineral density on osteoporotic treatment, current smoke, uh, drinks, alcohol, glucocorticoid exposure, diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, fragility fracture, uh, and uh, every risk fracture. And then we calculate the fracture risk calculator uh, to give an idea about uh, uh, the FRAX and the possibility of uh, future fractures. Next, please. Now we will shift to the management of osteoporosis. Uh, uh, so we have uh, two groups of agents. Anti-resorptive agents have demonstrated efficacy for fracture risk reduction, but there is also a significant role for the anabolic drug in treatment of osteoporosis, especially for those who develop clinical fr fractures during anti resorptive treatment. The duration of treatment should be individualized for each patient. Each patient has its own protocol and its own clinical picture and its own treatment. We are following the guideline, but we are individualizing them according to the patient need, as well as the drug holidays. Next, please. 
For the guidelines uh, uh, regarding the pharmacological treatment, we consider bifosphonase as the first therapeutic choice for postmenopausal women with high risk of fracture, with a reassessment of fracture risk after patient treatment with bifosphonate for three to five years, following reassessment prescribed a bifosphonate holiday for women who are at low risk of fracture, but as I tell before, it should be individualized for each patient. Next, please. Consider anabolic therapy, triparatide or abalaparatide for women at very high risk of fracture, including those with multiple fractures. All women undergoing treatment with osteoporosis uh, therapy rather than anabolic drugs should consume calcium and vitamin D in their diet or via supplement. And also, as uh, Professor Khalid uh, tell before, that we have dramatic values of vitamin D deficiency due to non-exposure in Arabic country to the sun. Monitor the, monitor the bone density at high-risk individuals with a low bone uh, mineral density every one uh, uh, to three years. Next, please. Next. So this slide will summarize. No, the, this one, please. This uh, slide will summarize the whole uh, guidelines or treatment algorithm. Uh, we have uh, to diagnose the osteoporosis and the history of fragility fracture and high fracture, as I tell before. Evaluate the causes of secondary osteoporosis in each patient. Uh, correct the calcium and vitamin D. Uh, then we can go to the recommendation for pharmacologic therapy. Uh, educational lifestyle measures, which is important uh, as regards fall prevention, uh, benefit and risk of medication. So we have two categories, a high risk, but no prior fractures. We will start with alendronate, uh, denosumab, risodrinate, uh, zolidronate. Alternative therapy would be ibendronate and raloxifene. Then we reassess yearly for response to therapy and fracture risk. Uh, if the response to therapy, there is increase or stable bone mineral density and no fracture, we consider a drug holiday, which will be individualized according to each patient need. And then uh, after five years of oral and three years of intravenous biophosphonate therapy, resume therapy when the fracture occur or bone mineral density declines beyond uh, the least significant change. And then if we have Progression of bone loss or recurrent fracture, we assess compliance, we evaluate the cause of secondary osteoporosis, maybe it, it was neglected by us, and then uh, if uh, it is uh, stable, we will switch to injectable antiresorptive of oral, uh, if on oral agent, or switch to uh, uh, abaloparatide uh, or uh, the new drug uh, romosozizumab or teripanatide if on injectable anti-resorption. We switch to another form, okay? Uh, the second category will be the very high risk of prior fracture. This needs more attention. So we give uh, abaloparatide, denosumab, uh, romozizumab, uh, teripanatide or zolid, uh, zolidronate. Alternative therapy will be uh, 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 alendronate or resitronate, then we assess yearly for response because it is more serious condition to therapy. Uh, denosumab, uh, if there is, uh, we will continue therapy until the patient is no longer at high risk uh, and uh, uh, ensure uh, the transition with another anti-resorptive agent. Uh, if it, he is using uh, the uh, roses map for one year, so there is sequential therapy with oral or, uh, 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 or uh, um, anti-resorptive agent. Uh, if he is using uh, abaloparatide, we will sequential therapy with uh, injectable anti-resorptive agent. If he is on zolindronate uh, and if he is stable, we will continue therapy for six years. A progression of bone loss or recurrent, we'll consider uh, uh, switching uh, to uh, abaloparatide or teriparatide or remosuzumab. 
So this is the, the whole, yeah, I think that this is the most important slide in my presentation, which will summarize all drugs we can use as a clinical tool for pharmacologic uh, therapy for osteoporosis who are at high risk or low risk of fracture or, or uh, who have a, a fractures. Next, please. What about the non-pharmacological therapy? Uh, as uh, Professor Khalid tell, uh, we have lifestyle modification with adequate intake of calcium and vitamin D, lifelong participation, regular weight bearing and balance improvement exercise to minimize fall, avoid smoking and alcohol, caffeine and soda, elimination of potential risk factors for falling. If the patient has uh, uh, some lumbar affection, he can resort to physiotherapy sessions. Next, please. Next, please. To sum up, there is updated guideline for osteoporosis reflects not only the latest evidence-based science, but also clinical experience and expert opinion. Anti-resorptive pharmacotherapy has demonstrated efficacy for fracture risk reduction, but there is also a significant role for anabolic therapy in treatment of severe osteoporosis or those who have clinical fractures during anti-resorptive use. The duration of therapy needs to be individualized as well as a holiday for drugs. Osteoporosis is a glo global awareness, is a must to build and maintain strong, healthy bones. And thank you. We'll collect uh, the questions uh, uh, at the end uh, of uh, the sessions because of uh, uh, time availability. And now we'll shift uh, to the next uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Sema. Will Dr. Sema please? Where is Dr. Sema? Dr. Matu, you are ready if he is in the clinic. You can start with the Professor Matu uh, because Dr. Samah, uh, it uh, seems that he is, is still in the clinic uh, uh, to see osteoporotic patients. Okay. Uh, now I will introduce my dear friend and my colleague, uh, Professor Matu Bahamir. Uh, she is uh, uh, one of the eminent uh, rheumatology consultant at JETA. Uh, she is uh, well known. Uh, she, is, she was the head of the department of a big institute, and now she is joining us as one of the active member and team. Uh, the mic is used, uh, uh, Professor Matua. Uh, she will talk about the Saudi pictures of osteoporosis, and uh, you will be surprised about the number and the facts. Uh, the mic is here. We'll take, sorry for the inconvenience, but we'll take uh, five minutes only for uh, 10 minutes for uh, Salah, please. And then we will uh, come back with uh, Professor Matu uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Keep, uh, keep uh, with us.
السلام عليكم we'll proceed uh, with our program uh, now we have an important talk uh, and presentation uh, by uh, professor Matu Abaimer uh, who is uh, our uh, consultant rheumatologist and uh, she was uh, a head of uh, uh, director of rehabilitation center in one uh, governmental institute uh, she will talk about the osteoporosis in Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, I think it is a very interesting topic. The mic is yours, Professor Matu. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Ilham. And thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to share this activity with you. Uh, today, I will speak about osteoporosis. Osteoporosis in Saudi Arabia. Uh, next slide, please. This is the outline of my lectures. I will speak about the uh, global of osteoporosis disease, uh, and then the disease uh, landscape in Saudi Arabia, the proportions and the epidemiology of osteoporosis at the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the cost and consequences of osteoporosis, osteoporosis, a national health priority, a gaps in osteoporosis uh, patient care pathway, and finally, national plan for osteoporosis prevention and management in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Next slide. Next slide, please. What is the global disease landscape? Uh, no disease has uh, um, attracted attention in the last two decades all over the world, such as osteoporosis. Being a silent disease with high prevalence among older populations, the battle is very difficult. Next. Osteoporosis is estimated to affect 200 million women worldwide. It's estimated 75 million people in Europe, United States of America, and Japan. Next. It causes worldwide more than 8.9 million fractures annually, resulting in osteoporosis fractures every three seconds. Worldwide, one out of three women over the age of 50 will experience osteoporosis fractures, as well as one in five men aged over 50. By 2050, the worldwide incidence of hip fractures in men and women projected to be increased by 310 percentage and 240 compared to the rate in 1990, which is a huge difference. Next. Next, please. According to the Saudi General Authority for Statistics, the populations of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in the mid of 2017, the population was 32.6 million. 60% composed of Saudi populations, nationality. Individual over 50 years of age comprise 13% of the Saudi national populations. Um, Mr. Sadat showed that the prevalence rate in 2017 of osteoporosis or of the total osteoporosis populations is composed of 940,000, 546,000 in men and 394 in women. Between 2007 and 2017, if we can see appreciate slides, I don't know whether I can have a mouse. Anyhow, uh, we can see that uh, the, 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 the estimate uh, the estimate uh, populations uh, of osteoporosis prevalence between 2007 and 2017 increased. The estimate burdens of osteoporosis in Saudi nationality more than 50 years and old has increased by more than 1.5. And based on that, we can expect that the burden will be more. Next. The study provides data on 780 proximal femur fractures collected from 24 uh, center uh, or hospital in the Eastern province. It showed that overall incidence of osteoporosis fractures is 4,950 per 1 million, a total of 7,500 7, uh, over the populations of uh, more than 50 or more. Not only the uh, the prevalence increase also the prevalence increase with the increased age as we can see at the age of between 60 and 70 
uh, five, uh, between 65 to 69, the male and female uh, uh, prevalence will be the same incidence, while with increasing age, more female will be affected. Next. Osteoporosis causes a painful pro, uh, break and fractions leading to reduced mobility, reduced health generally, and reduced quality of life, disability, and losses. It has been noted in a study that in one year mortality rate associated with fragility femoral fractures was high, up to 27%, which is considered a great. Bouchet in 2007 estimated that the total cost of hospital stay after one fragility fractures, it's cost 48 million, uh, so, sorry, 48,000 per patient. The estimate cost was 48 million annually. In 2017, a retrospective study on, two, on, on 370 men aged more than 50 years and old uh, referred for Texas scan at tertiary hospital in uh, Al Khubar. They found that around 60% were osteoporotic based on spinal T score. Next. Uh, as we can see that not only the, the incidence is increased, the consequences of that also there. The direct cost, as we mentioned before, per patient is around 75,000 uh, Saudi real per fragility femoral fractures. And the total is 664 million uh, real. While the, this is the direct cost, the yearly indirect cost expected to be more maybe three, three uh, times more than the direct, and the total costs can be reached to 1.7 billion Saudi Riyadh. The total cost to treat, so the total cost of direct and indirect uh, cost of fragility femoral fractures, it uh, can be reached up to 2.3 million, billion, sorry, all over. On national basis, with populations of 1.5, around 1.5 uh, Saudi aged 50 years and old, what we expect 8,768 8, would suffer from femoral fracture with a cost of 4.2 uh, 4 billion. Next. Uh, if we can see from this graph, which is an interesting graph, that if we can see that the overall total or uh, of direct cost of osteoporosis is 546,000, uh, which is much less than, than the cost of the caused by diabetes. But if we looked closely to the direct cost per patient or uh, the, the cost of fragility femoral fractures, the difference is great. Maybe three times the, in, in uh, diabetes, the, the patient cost uh, 15,000, while the osteoporotic fracture is 75,000. So the burdens on the, uh, uh, I mean, on the society is high. Next. 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 Okay. Uh, please, back, please. Back. Yeah. Uh, next. Yeah. This, um, the Saudi Arabia population's age pyramids. Uh, which was published in 2017. Saudi Arabian current populations, uh, the demographic data showed it's young, it's more in the line, with the male, main cluster, uh, cluster is between the age of 20 and 50. And uh, it's make around 47%, while the age populations or the, the, those above the age of 50 is constituted around 14%. Next. By time, it's postulated or expected that by 2025, this percentage will be increased to 26%, and hence in 2030, expected the percentage to be 30. Next. And not only this, the life expectancy of the elderly will be increased from 63, uh, from 63, sorry, in 1980, to reach up to 79, uh, by 2050. So with this increasing age, with increasing the percentage of populations of uh, uh, people above 50, 
we can estimate that the cost of uh, osteoporosis and osteoporotic related fractures will be increased. And this study, by, it was estimated by, that by 2030, the cost of uh, osteoporosis can cost uh, 2.5 billion. And by 2025, it can be reached to 35 billion. Next. So what, what are the steps has been taken? Many steps has been taken, but it was uh, individual either by the Saudi Society of Osteoporosis or my Ministry of Health or uh, many other activities with, which was, has been done over the last uh, few decades, uh, including local recommendations, guidelines, the diagnostic uh, information, management of osteoporosis, national osteoporosis awareness programs, uh, some uh, prevention awareness, Osteoporosis Club uh, under the umbrella of uh, Saudi Society of Osteoporosis. And uh, a mini symposium it was held also in that uh, in this field, hoping to decrease the burdens of or increase the awareness of the disease among the healthcare professionals and uh, also the populations. Next. But still, there is a gap in uh, this actions. There, is, there, are next, there are many barriers uh, face the patients in reaching the, the, the service. The first barrier is being uh, aware of the disease, um, its risk factor and uh, exhibitions for bone health behavior. The second bar barrier is issue related to access to services, availability of the diagnostic uh, screening and um, primary care uh, behavior. And the third barriers is related to the availability, the use of prescriptions, medications availability. And lastly, issue with the adherence to the treatment, poor uh, fractures care and self-management. As we can see, uh, the journey of the patients in, um, uh, in uh, or I mean in the, uh, the journey of patients and getting the reliable medications or eligible medications or uh, treatment for his uh, problems, it will be decreased. And there is a lot of uh, issue. And so the, in the care pathway, we are expecting less number will benefit from this. Next. Um, next. Next. Next, please. Okay, uh, if we look to the gap of education, osteoporosis and dietary awareness in children, uh, and a study done in uh, at Eastern Province, it showed that the percentage of girls or school girls, um, the perceptions that uh, fruits and vegetables has a high vitamin D is very minimum. In this study, they showed that only 24% of the girls and 15% uh, of the boys, they know that the vegetables and food, they are rich in vitamin D. Vitamin D uh, deficiency is significantly high among uh, girls and boys at the school age. It's uh, uh, the osteoporosis awareness in the adult also, there's a gap in uh, this part of, I mean, educations of the society or the populations. A cross-section studies done included 505 participants conducted in several malls in Riyadh. They show that uh, most of the participants, they are, not, uh, they are aware about some area or some things about osteoporosis. Uh, and the source of information is unfortunately from the media. Next. A systematic review on the prevalence of uh, of uh, vitamin D deficiency. We know that the vitamin D deficiency uh, prevalence is very high in Saudi Arabia, and many studies uh, conducted and showed that the rate is range between around, uh, it can be reached up to 80%, 80, uh, 80 which is considered very high. Next. The second gap is the, uh, in the diagnosis. Adequate access and the frequency of BMD testing for high-risk populations. In retrospective uh, cross-sectional studies conducted in uh, orthopedic surgery, they found that only uh, out of those patients presented to the, 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 to the orthopedic clinic or with the osteoporotic fractures, only 51% uh, had received the BMD testing. 
family physicians and uh, general practitioners usage and attitude towards the BMD testing. Uh, also, there is a gap that in a, a survey among uh, general practitioners, uh, they found they found that only 60% of the participants they they examined their patient or they asked their patient about the risk factors of osteoporosis, and even the main tool of investigation of investigation for osteoporosis uh, is BMD, and only 13% is those who requested BMD for their patients. Next. Poor BMD testing rates linked to low treatment rate in at uh, risk populations. Um, uh, I like this study, which is shows really interesting data. That this is study analyzing the chest radiograph of uh, consecutive Saudi Arabian been more than fifty years and uh, who visited ER in secondary hospital. Uh, out of eight hundred seventy six radiograph, they could analyze. They found that thirteen percent they have um, a fractures. Out of this 13%, only 22 had a report that uh, uh, report of the presence of the fractures. And unfortunately, this reported fractures, no action has been done. Out of this 22, only six has a BMD testing, which indicate that there is a poor of information, a poor awareness and uh, no active um, line of, uh, of treatments in this line. Next. Post fracture care, either osteoporosis testing for post fragility fractures patients and reporting of BMD in such patients, physician follow up of osteoporosis treatment for post fragility fractures, uh, post fractures patients starting on osteoporosis treatment. Um, I'm sorry for this slide, but the the uh, the issue from uh, from this that there is uh, a gap in um, availability of uh, DEXA scan and for utilizations of this scan for the high um, high risk group. Next, other credible epidemiological data and osteoporosis scientific output. Uh, unfortunately, uh, um, with the report of scientific output related to osteoporosis till 2012 and after, uh, Saudi, uh, Saudi only ranked the 45th in the work of osteoporosis. Research about osteoporosis from Arab countries was very low until 2002, but the things is improving, unfortunately. Around 7%, uh, around a total uh, 426 documents about osteoporosis were published from uh, Arab countries, which represent 0.9 of the global uh, research output. At the risk populations, at a high breed, the, the dispositions to fall and uh, adherence to medications. Uh, the study to identify the risk of a fac uh, factors of fall, it found that. Uh, 23% uh, of women reported at least one fall, and 10% uh, they reported multiple fall. Next. Next. So, uh, we conclusion from the previous slide that people with high big bone mass in elderly in early lives have a lower uh, risk of bone, bone thinning in the later life. Hence, poor dietary habits, low level of physical activity, and insufficiency levels of calcium, vitamin D may lead to increase the predisposition to development of bone-related issues such as osteoporosis and osteopenia. Poor awareness about the disease and low vitamin D level among senior and high-risk populations may manifest themselves as a fragility fracture. Limited role of family physicians from osteoporosis care pathway compared, uh, compound the problems of poor diagnosis rate and consequent uh, low treatment uh, initiation and resistance. Insufficient post fracture BMD testing, inadequate, inadequate anti resorptive therapy. Next. So, for this reason, uh, the Ministry of Health is aware about all these problems which face osteoporosis in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And all the, the key to improve or overcome all these, uh, these uh, gaps is to focus uh, it's the key area or key focus area in education and the health promotions, screening, uh, diagnosis, and treatment, both fra uh, fractured care management and uh, secondary prevention. 
self-management and false preventions and uh, research and evaluations. Next. 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 So uh, this indicates a mandatory policy and actions needed to establish the policies which required, uh, which requires uh, collaborations of Ministry of Health, uh, Saudi Society of Health Process, public government. So it's a con comprehensive strategy is needed. That's why a national plan for osteoporosis uh, prevention and management in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, to, uh, was conducted in 20, to, uh, 2018. Uh, this national plan, uh, next please, there's uh, one slide missing. Uh, can you go back please? Yeah, national plan action plan working group consists of Ministry of Health, Health Programs, Chronic Disease uh, Directorate, Saudi Osteoporosis Society, expert panel from uh, Dr. Alia Khan and Dr. David Kendler. Next. This national plan of osteoporosis for prevention and management of osteoporosis in Saudi Arabia is very great, really plan. And we are expecting improvement in all the, the data I presented before and deficiency and the uh, public awareness, the availability of uh, DEXA scan. And we are expe and expecting to decrease, uh, to help to decrease the, uh, the cost of the osteoporosis and to, to decrease the number of osteoporotic fractures among populations. Uh, in the part of the education, educations uh, of uh, and health promotions, as we, if you remember, I uh, I discussed how is educations, uh, the society, the patient. There is a lack of uh, information of educations. So the first recommendations is uh, regarding the education is to create a materials and programs for the community focused on increasing public knowledge around uh, osteoporosis, including educations about disease. Uh, to monize the risk of osteoporosis, health uh, dietary intake, uh, uh, importance of regular physical activity and disease management and bone health uh, among children. Next. The second recommendation is to, to train and educate uh, medical trainee and uh, healthcare provider through college programs and continuous medical uh, education. Next. I will go through these recommendations. It's available online, but uh, I will at least tell what, what is the plan of this um, national plan to enhance the role of general physicians, uh, primary care physicians, family physicians to diagnose and treat osteoporosis and early stage. Next. The fourth recommendation is to update local guidelines and ensuring its uniformity uh, and ensure the guidelines are updated every two years. The fifth recommendation to state national level mandatory uh, uh, in state uh, national level mandatory uh, BMD reporting, certification scores, and further development. Next, uh, develop and then or improve for the existing assessment tool for predictions of the incidence of fracture in individual. Actually, uh, FRAX was not available for Saudi. But fortunately, after this national round now, it's available, and I will uh, speak about that in the last slide. Next. It has been noted in study that the one-year mortality rate associated with fragility femoral fractures was high, and the survivor exhibiting significant functional disability. It's, this indicates that uh, the post fracture care in Kingdom Saudi Arabia is not as established as it should be. So the seventh recommendation is to, is to establish uh, fracture liaison service and rehabilitation service to prevent further fractures and improve quality of life. Next. The eighth recommendation to effective disease management ultimately lies in the hands of the individual patients who must have responsibility for key health behavior related to bone health. And according to the study, I define the risk factor, I mean, to, to manage this risk factor. Hence, it's the 
It is the key to build uh, support for people with a high risk of osteoporosis and develop uh, non-pharmacological interventions directed at preventing falls. Next. Uh, in order to know the impact of the national plan on the country public health, an evaluation committee needed uh, to be set uh, to overlook the implementation and monitoring this outcome. For this reason, general cred uh, credible disease data and real world evidence on osteoporosis in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They conduct a prospective multi center to, to conduct uh, a prospective multi center uh, cohort study across conductive regularity and financial atmosphere and establish committee to set up a national fracture registry and national registry for patients' diagnosis via uh, BMD, which ensure the necessity of steps are taken. Next. Uh, the research. Uh, also, or research and evaluations from the committee that uh, overlooked the, uh, the impl uh, implementations uh, on the outcome of national plan in Saudi Arabia. The last recommendations, next. Ensure necessity long-term uh, research and knowledge transfer in osteoporosis through activities. Uh, I will go back to the recommendation number 10. Um, the plan is um, the um, the plan in Saudi Arabia in order to qualify and uh, quantify uh, the impact of uh, actions on the prevalence and incidence of the disease in the country and to ensure broad alignment to the KBI set under the National Transformations Plan in Vision 2030. Next. Next. Uh, um, the fracture assessment tool, as I mentioned, that fracture, uh, the FRAX was not available before, and uh, now it's available. We can reach that by just doing um, um, Google search, uh, Saudi FRAX, and you will get uh, this uh, picture. Next. 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 Yeah, this, uh, you will get this one, Sheffield uh, University. Frags, go to the calculations tools, choose the Middle East uh, of Africa, and then uh, here the Saudi, and you will get this, uh, the Saudi Arabia, and you will get the FRAX uh, assessment for Saudi. Also, a regional or country specific database from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is now is, uh, conducting at the King Saudi University. Uh, uh, Dr. Nasser is conducting that to get more data uh, uh, presenting Saudi. Next. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Matua, for this very nice and informative uh, presentation. Uh, you highlighted uh, the gaps and the uh, plan for uh, osteoporotic prevention in Saudi Arabia, and you give the FRAX tool, or Saudi uh, FRAX tool, which is very important. Uh, and uh, now we will shift uh, to another uh, topic uh, with uh, Professor Sameh Abdel Latif. He is uh, our colleague in rheumatology department in Saudi German Hospital and Beverly Clinic. He is an assistant professor of rheumatology at Al Azhar University. He will talk about another interesting topic, which is glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Elham, for a kind invitation and kind. Thank you for this uh, kind uh, invitation. Uh, today, the remaining item, I think so, we will discuss in what is called glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. So I will not control. Next. Uh, glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis is one of drugs induced osteoporosis. So we have a lot of list, detailed list about some medicine which may cause this osteoporosis also, like anti-epileptic, antidepressant, proton bump inhibitors, heparins, diuretics, sex hormones modifier, and the cyclosporins. And of course, each of these molecules, each of these uh, medication has its uh, own story. Next, please. 
So why more focus on steroid? Why more focus on glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis? Next, please. Uh, GIO or glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis is the most common cause of secondary osteoporosis. And it is the leading iatrogenic cause of the disease. So uh, this area of interest, and this is uh, commonly uh, coming for the uh, discussion. Next. So we will give an overview about glucocorticoids. So after this, we'll go to glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, pathogenesis, and management. Next. Glucocorticoids have become the most important and frequently used class of anti inflammatory drugs since their introduction into clinical practice in 1948. The estimated prevalence of use in glucocorticoids in the general adult population ranges from 0.5 up to 1.2%. Next. The 1.2% prevalence is an estimate from states corresponding to around 2.5 million individuals mostly chronic glucocorticoid users, with non-significant downward trend of glucocorticoid use from 1999 to 2008. Next. The major reason for widespread use of these drugs are next to low cost, their versatility and effectiveness, especially if applied at higher dosage and or for longer treatment duration. And this sometimes lead to patient disuse because um, some of our patients have find uh, effective, cheap, uncontrolled medicine. They go to continue using even without a prescription or even out of the patient recommend the doctor recommendation. Next, please. Glucocorticoids are often the first line therapy for autoimmune diseases, lung disorders, and the many neurological conditions. Their use is commonly associated with complications and comorbidities. Next. So we have two corners. We have two sides of glucocorticoids. We have this, this is the shiny corner, where we find the anti-inflammatory effect and the immunosuppression, which lead to decreasing pain, swelling, stiffness, and physical disability, and the anti-allergic effect also. While on the other dark side, we find a lot of side effects, starting from infection up to uh, cardiovascular system infection, and of course, including bone resorption. Next, please. Recently, the increased understanding of basic inflammatory mechanisms provide the basis for the development of new drugs. New applications have been introduced, and the international guidelines on therapy and management have been created enabling safer use of these drugs. Next. We have a terminology, some terms like what is the difference between corticosteroids, glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, and gonadocorticoids even. And we uh, are here to highlight the difference between these uh, terms. Next. Glucocorticoid is one form of steroid, and the term steroid refers to the basic steroid skeleton. This is a steroid skeleton, four rings and 17 atoms of carbon. Cholesterol is the precursor of all steroid hormones, such as gonadosteroids, mineralocorticoids, and glucocorticoids. Next, please. Next. Classification of steroid, back please. Classification of steroids into mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids is not completely accurate because the groups slightly overlap. Especially endogenous glucocorticoids also have some mineralocorticoid effect. However, synthetic or exogenous steroid drugs are more restricted to glucocorticoid effect only. Therefore, it is considered more logic to use the terminology glucocorticoids. Next. Glucocorticoids can also be classified according to duration of their effect or their solubility in water and other characteristic. These estimated potencies are useful in daily clinical practice as a general therapeutic guideline. Next. We have also some classification, which is important clinical classification to glucocorticoids according to doses. Generally, because it depends mainly on the current clinical situation and the uh, body weight, but generally speaking, roughly low dose is considered up to 7.5 milligram per day, medium from 7.5 up to 30, 
high dose from 30 to 100, and very high dose is considered greater than 100 milligram per day from prednisolone. We, we, we highlight here it is from prednisolone because according to this table, we have what is called the steroid equivalency chart. Not all steroids are then the same potency and the same glucocorticoid versus mineral corticoid potency or the half-life. And the difference between all these molecules or all these subtypes gives the doctor or physician the chance or the ability to choose the correct and suitable medicine for each type and each indication. Next. We can see hydrocortisone in the weakest one, while vitamidazone is the strongest one. Vitamidazone and dexamethasone have long half life, and side effects can occur even after stopping off the medicine. Next, please. Perfect description of glucocorticoid, not just prescribing the medicine or therapy, but should also include the dosage and the type of drug, also route for administration, time for administration during the day, robust duration of therapy, and the cumulative dose. Please. There is some evidence that high doses of inhaled steroids may be associated with reduced bone, bone mineral density and the small increase in fracture risk. Increased fracture risk has also been reported with intermittent oral glucocorticoid therapy. So we must choose exactly or we must neglect any member of the steroid, even inhaler forms. Next. Okay, this as regard glucocorticoids. What about glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis? A key point is that underlying the underlying inflammation for which glucocorticoids are used has a role, yani very, very uh, important role in bone fragility. And there is a strong relation between inflammatory cells and bone cells. This is one of the determination or determinants why the rabbit bone loss occurring at the initiation of glucocorticoids. We here in the coming slides, we will try to differentiate what is the difference between osteoporosis and the glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, why it is important like this to, uh, to up, up to this extension, please. The bone fragility in glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis characterized by two key points. The early and the rabbit bone loss at introduction of the medicine, steroid, and the discrepancy between bone mineral density and the risk of fracture. These points can be explained by the pathogenesis of steroid-induced osteoporosis. Please. This um, yani short slide differentiates between the normal healthy population, post osteoporosis, and glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. So while in healthy women, bone formation and bone resorption are coupled under normal physiological circumstances. And this in postmenopausal osteoporosis is upregulated. The whole process is upregulated. Okay, in case, in our case of glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, there is uncoupling during this uh, glucocorticoid induction. Why? Because bone formosh, uh, bone formation is inhibited during the use of glucocorticoids. Why bone resorption is elevated or unchanged. However, interpretation of bone remodeling in patients receiving glucocorticoids should consider, consider the effect of inflammation related to the underlying disease. So we have bone formation, which is inhibited more and more during the use of glucocorticoid, bone resorption nearly unchanged or even elevated, and also the extent of inflammation, which play an important role in enhancement of osteoporosis. Yes. The mechanism of glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis appear to be related to inhibitory effect on bone formation more than effect of bone resorption. In a large part, this is due to glucocorticoid effect on the osteoblast because the, the main blade prayer here is the osteoblast. The main target for glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis is osteoblast, as we will see. Glucocorticoids have direct and indirect effect on bone turnover. They inhibit osteocyte and osteoblast function through several mechanisms. This include decrease in production of bone anabolic factors. There is affection of the bone anabolic factors which are affecting the bone formation or enhanced bone formation. There is interference with wind signaling pathway. 
and this without regulation of wind inhibitors such as sclerostin. And I think this is a big era, and this is a good chance for the new coming medicine to work about. Also, there is stimulation of apoptosis of osteoblast and osteocytes. And finally, stimulation differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells into adipocyte pathway at the expense on differentiation into osteoblast. All these factors lead to inhibition of osteoblast and inhibition of bone formation. Effect on osteoclast uh, for glucocorticoids, it upregulates the ratio between the rankle OBG system and the may increase osteoclastogenesis as a direct consequence of suppressed osteoblast differentiation. We have also important effect here because glucocorticoid enhanced disruption of collagen, what is called collagenolysis, and it does allow continued contact for osteoclast with minerals, thereby maintaining resorption uninterrupted, not like an unusual normal physiology, okay? As a result, glucocorticoid ch changes the osteoclastic resorption mode from intermittent to be continuous. The process will be continuous and continuing, leading to changing the shape of the resorption site. Instead to be usual rounded shape resorption pits, it will be like trench, trench-like exact condition. Please. This phenomena, by impairing quickly the mechanical properties of bone, may explain the rapid rise in fracture risk in spite of limited reduction in bone uh, mineral density, because sometimes we found that do, as doing the XIT score for a patient is, uh, for example, minus two, and for the same patient, uh, for another patient on glucocorticoid, also minus two, but there is a big difference that we will check later in the so this is a summary about the glucocorticoid therapy affection on osteoplast, osteocyte, and osteoclast. On osteoplast and osteocyte, there is activation of pro-apoptotic molecules leading to reduction of osteocyte number, also decrease osteoblastogenesis, decrease osteoblast number, this leading to decrease bone formation on long term, while affect through OBG and Rankel OBG system, this affect an osteoclast leading to increase osteoclastogenesis, increase activity, and by, by at the end, increasing the bone resorption, and this is early fine. Please. And direct effect on bone quality also related to sex hormone concentration, related to calcium homeostasis, and the muscle effects. Sometimes estrogen and steroid concentrations can be decreased with the resulting negative effect in bone resorption and bone formation. On the other hand, glucocorticoids also decrease intestinal calcium absorption and increase urinary excretion as a result of decreased renal tubular reabsorption. Secondary hyperparathyroidism can occur from lower mid body calcium content. Glucocorticoids have also a direct catabolic effect on muscle mass and the muscle force. The incidence of muscle weakness and the myopathy can reach up to 50% of patients receiving long-term steroid and they may increase the risk of falls and fracture. So it is just not just working on the bone, just also on the other elements of the musculoskeletal system, including the muscles. So again, the most important effect of glucocorticoid of bone metabolism coming from decreased bone formation after this affection of bone resorption. This is mostly during the first six to uh, 12 months of treatment. Also, we have a production of apoptosis for uh, cells and the leading to link term and decreased bone turnover. Disturbed calcium metabolism also and secondary hyperparathyroidism. So here, glucocorticoids are not just leading to osteoporosis, but also lead to increased risk of fractures through acting on bone and the other elements of the musculoskeletal system. On bone through cytology, as we discussed before, osteocyte, osteoblast, and osteoclast and on the other system through muscles, calcium metabolism, and the neuroendocrine system. And the final result will be 
to decrease bone quality, decrease bone mass, and increase the risk of fracture. Okay, how to assess this group corticoid-induced osteoporosis? What is what is the difference? I know um, our dear professors touch a lot and speak a lot about uh, osteoporosis, but what is the difference? How what what make uh, glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis different as regard assessment and management. Here we must to rely on fracture risk. Fracture risk is very important rather than bone densiometry. The use of glucocorticoids has not only devastating effect on bone mass and bone strength, but also on fracture risk. The greatest risk being for vertebral fracture. Many risk factors associated with glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, including the TH, menopause, previous fractures, also low bony mass index, and the high steroid dose, either current or cumulative dose, and the underlying disease, especially our patients suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. Fracture increase also with increasing glucocorticoid dose and the duration. And this is calculated roughly at fracture risk increase with dose, if the dose is coming around 2.5 milligram, it may affect, but the affection for non-steroid user, it is not the big deal, not the big difference, just 1.5 fold. While if we are moved by the dose from 2.5 up to 7.5, it will be around 2.5 folds higher. And the dose is over 7.5 milligram up to five, fold higher than the non-steroid user. And this, of course, related also to the duration because fracture risk increase within three to six months after initiation and increase with longer durations. Uh, the steroid also mostly affects trabecular bone of vertebrae. And postmenopausal women receiving long-term glucocorticoids, systemic spine radiographs showed the presence of asymptomatic vertebral fracture in 30% of uh, patients, as uh, Dr. Matupa uh, uh, highlighted uh, before me, uh, the, the, uh, the evaluation, the good evaluation of the vertebral fracture is very mandatory and very important, and they may pick up a lot of patients because sometimes it may be asymptomatic. Assessment of vertebral fractures is highly recommended in the management of patients with steroid, considering that these fractures can be asymptomatic because of analgesic and anti-inflammatory effect of glucocorticoids and other medicine. Okay, when we'll go for risk fracture assessment in patient receiving glucocorticoid therapy, we must this process done for any patient receiving glucocorticoid for at least three months. And this must include clinical history with details of comorbidities, glucocorticoid use, either previous or ongoing, dose duration, even root administration, also fracture history, type fracture, type of trauma, alcohol intake or smoking, family history of osteoporosis, hip fracture, and the risk of fall. All of these items must to be elaborated to check what is the risk fracture exactly. Who has a high fracture? Of course, the extreme sides of all of these items, older age, more than 60, low, ban, low body mass index, less than, less than 24. If have underlying chronic inflammatory process, especially RA, certain GC receptor genotypes, and they increase the some enzymes activity, which activate or change the cortisone from inactive form to active form like this enzyme, 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Higher glucocorticoid use, longer duration, low bone mineral density, and there are the other general risk factors which are found also in the um, population of osteoporosis, like uh, personal and family history fractures, smoking, and alcohol consumption. Okay, FRAX. FRAX, uh, FRAX which is a system uh, developed by WHO um, to assess exactly the fracture prevention algorithm. The FRAX is very, very important for assessing of uh, osteoporotic patients because they transfer us from the just the, clean, the data and the, the medical data up to the clinical uh, and the risk of fracture. But here in glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, 
FRAX underestimates the fracture risk in patients on glucocorticoid therapy. The FRAX should therefore be used with caution. Why? Because um, it takes into account the glucocorticoid use, but it doesn't account for those, it doesn't account for duration of therapy. The prevalent fracture commonly occur in vertebral spine, yet the FRAX usually uses the bone mineral density at the femoral neck. What about the rule of bone densitometry in glucocorticoid induced stool process? Sometimes we have mismatch, mismatch between the bone mineral density data and the fracture data. The patient receiving glucocorticoids because of the disparity related to alteration of bone quality. A similar level, a similar level of bone densitometry, for example, if we found two patients, the same R T score with minus two, postmenopausal woman taking glucocorticoid have considerable higher risk fracture than controlled man user of glucocorticoids, even they all have the same T-score. Measurement of bone densitometry by DEXA at the spine and hips alone is insufficient uh, to predict the risk of fracture. More comprehensive approach risk is necessary is clinical judgment remain must to be done. Also, we need lateral imaging, our DEXA with vertebral fracture assessment for the detection of existing vertebral fractures. If this is not available, we will go back again, again to the lateral X-ray of the thoracic and the lumbar spine should be considered with back pain or even high loss. We have also one measurement which is give um, more idea about the bone quality and the risk of fracture at trabecular bone scores. This obtained by analyze, analysis of the DEXA scan, which can differentiate two microarchitecture surfaces with the same bone mineral density value, but has different trabecular characteristics. This scan has been shown to correlate the trabecular bone over the tissue volume and the number of trabeculae. A higher trabecular bone scan suggest, score suggests stronger fracture resistant bone compared with those with lower uh, trabecular bone score or scan. So this is very important if it is available to analyze the DEXA image, okay? Not just to rely on the T-score, okay? We must to, uh, go deeper and go to analyze the trabecular bone over the tissue volume. Next slide. What about uh, other values or other uh, parameters for uh, management or for assessment? Laboratory testing should be performed, of course, to exclude causes of secondary osteoporosis other than glucocorticoid use, including assessment of vitamin D status and renal function. What about bone markers? Since bone turnover after long-term glucocorticoid therapy is low, test, testing bone remodeling or bone markers are not helpful in follow-up of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. So we are coming now to the management of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. First of all, and the, the, the first and the very important thing is the general measures. Lifestyle measures are very important, which include adequate level of dietary protein and the calcium intake, and of course, vitamin D supplementation, and we saw how we are suffering from uh, vitamin D deficiency. Maintenance of normal body weight, tobacco and alcohol abuse should be avoided. The risk of falling should be assessed and uh, managed. Also physical activity, especially weight bearing exercise. Some of our patients ask us, what about the suitable type of exercise or uh, sport I can do? Okay, and it is weight bearing either using um, external weights to strengthen your muscles, or even using your body as a, as weight-bearing uh, exercise. This physical activity or mobilization should be considered, and also according to the underlying condition, because some patients are uh, not able to do most of exercise. Use of alternative immunosuppressive agents enabled to reduce the dose of glucocorticoid should be considered. Next, please. Next. What about pharmacological intervention? 
we have uh, I mean, a lot of guidelines, Dr. Ibrahim touched a lot of this about the guideline exists for osteoporosis. But in case of glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, they vary in when to initiate osteoporosis medication. Most guidelines recommend the starting therapy at the onset of glucocorticoid therapy. If at least prednisolone 5 milligram or its equivalent, according to the table before, is planned for at least three months or more. Next. Most glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis studies are short term and under power to evaluate fractures because it's using DEXA or another bone marker instead or as an alternate for fracture. For example, this study, which including anti resortive administrated for two years to patient receiving at least prednisone 7.5 milligram for at least three months, have been associated with significant decrease in new vertebral fracture. It was 0.7% versus 6.8 in placebo. But however, this uh, was accompanied by no change in non vertebral fracture. Next. Next, please. Tiriparatide has anabolic effect was also studied as a 20 microgram daily, has been compared with anti resortive for three years in patients on at least prednisone 5 milligram daily for at least three months. All four patients with DEXA T score minus two or less, and the bone mineral density improved more in patient receiving chiriparatide than in patient receiving anti resortive medicine. So the, the pharmacological treatment differ from case to case, and they differ if we are using, we'll start with anabolic effect or medicine with anabolic effect, or we'll start with anti resort effect. Uh, this yani, uh, differ from case to case and must to be uh, managed in, in detailed or individualized position. Please. Okay, glucocorticoid and just those two process something which is more easy to be prevented or even adjusted rather than to be treated. Because it is very difficult and very complicated issue. And of course, and finally, please, next. Finally, remember, medicine is a double-bladed weapon. And uh, all the Arab people uh, speak about Medicine is like poison. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, you for this nice uh, informative presentation. And uh, now we will come uh, to the last presentation. Uh, we are pl uh, pleased uh, to introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Serge Ferreri. Uh, he is a professor of medicine and chairman of the academic department of medicine, uh, Geneva Faculty of Medicine Health Service and Laboratory of Wound Diseases, Gene Geneva University Hospital. When it comes to osteoporosis, uh, Professor Serge is one of the eminent to, uh, uh, presenters of uh, any subjects regarding, uh, regarding uh, osteoporosis. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Serge uh, will present a new uh, novel treatment uh, regarding uh, osteoporosis with different mode of action. And uh, the mic is yours, Professor Ferrer. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Um, Very good. Hi. You, hello, everyone. You you okay. too? Hello. Hello, I'm here. So let me share my screen. Okay. Sure, sir. Minimize this. Do that. Hopefully, you can see my screen now. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, and congratulations, by the way, to the previous speaker for an excellent uh, comprehensive lecture on uh, glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. My lecture is on severe osteoporosis and uh, a new uh, treatment uh, in that context. 
So as we, um, as we all know, uh, osteoporosis is, uh, is a disease that uh, has a various expressions, it's a spectrum of disease, uh, as illustrated by the uh, two ladies on the left at very different stages of the disease. Uh, the one on the left, uh, she never had a fracture, not yet, but she may be at risk because of uh, low bone density and increasing age. Now, the one on the right, she's at a much more advanced stage of the disease. Obviously, she's older and she's frail because she already had uh, severe fractures, including a vertebral fracture and a hip fracture. Now, when those fractures occur, the risk of a second fracture increases tremendously. So after a vertebral fracture, the risk of a subsequent fracture within just one year is up to 26%. And after a hip fracture, the relative risk of a second fracture is eight to tenfold higher in the first few months, couple of years. And then this risk comes back down to about twofold the risk of the general population. This is further illustrated in this Medicare survey from the US, women age 65 and above who had a recent fracture of any site, spine, pelvis, clavicle, etc. And what you see here is the percentage who has a second fracture within just two years. So as shown in the previous study, after a vertebral fracture, about 25% of the women have a second osteoporotic fracture in a couple of years. If you go to the pelvis or the uterus, it's up to 15% who has a second fracture in two years, same after the hip, etc. So this time window of about one to two years after the initial fracture is a period of very high risk. And we call this the imminent risk of refracturing. So obviously these women will need very efficient, potent and rapid treatments so we can eventually prevent the second fracture to occur. Now the problem is that with standard therapy, there is a delay in the anti-fracture efficacy. This is the fractures from the uh, zoledronate study after hip fractures. So zoledronate after hip fractures administered within three months of a hip fracture significantly reduced second fractures. Here, for example, it reduced by 27% the risk of a clinical non-vertebral fracture, and it reduced non-significantly the risk of a second hip fracture. However, as you see from the Kaplan-Meier curves, by giving an infusion of zoledronate within three months after the initial hip fracture, it takes more than a year before the curves diverge, which means that for one to two years, there is little protection, even with the most potent bisphosphonate, little protection in those women with a recent fracture whereas they are at imminent risk just in this period where our standard treatments are not maximally effective. So again, there was the need for treatments that act more rapidly and more potently for these women at imminent and very high risk. And in that context, the more recent algorithm for the management of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women by the European societies and IOF have delineated three groups of patients according to FRAX. Those who are at low risk, high risk, and now newly identified very high risk. And women at very high risk are those whose uh, risk of fracture is not just above the usual intervention threshold, but much above that. And those include the women with a recent fracture. 
And what those guidelines propose is that for those women at very high risk, the initial therapy should be an anabolic drug, then followed by an anti-resorptive rather than an anti-resorptive, which would be more uh, 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 recommended in women with a high risk. And this recommendation for uh, anabolics in very high immune risk also comes from some uh, calculations as shown here of the number of fractures prevented by those various therapy in treating a thousand women. So if you treat a thousand women with imminent fracture risk because they had a recent fracture, you will spare about 20 fractures if you give them alendronate, 40 with denosumab, 45 with teriparatide, and up to 60 if you treat them with the new drug romosozumab. So in every case, parenteral drugs will be more effective in preventing fractures in women at very high imminent risk. And among the parenteral drugs, the anabolics, again, seem to provide an even greater protection against the secondary fracture. So now let me expand about romosozumab and first of all, how it works. So the bottom line is that nature provides us with a break on bone formation. And that break is a molecule called sclerostin, which is produced by osteocytes. And when this sclerostin targets the cells on the surface of the bone, it prevents the differentiation and activation of osteoblasts. So sclerostin is really the foot on the break of bone formation. Now, mutations of nature have shown that when sclerostin is deficient, there is a high bone mass. In fact, there is what we call sclerosteosis, which is very large packets of bone, which are very solid. So the idea of romosozumab is a monoclonal antibody that targets sclerostin, and by targeting it, it prevents sclerostin to go on the osteoblast. So by blocking sclerostin, romosozumab unleashes surface bone formation. But the novelty really here is that as it promotes bone formation, simultaneously, it inhibits osteoclast bone resorption. So romosozumab has a dual mechanism of action whereby it increases formation and reduces resorption. And this is shown, for example, here on bone biopsies that were taken just two months after initiating romosozumab therapy or placebo in osteoporotic women. And after just two months of the treatment, which basically means two injections because these are monthly subcutaneous injections, after just two injections, you see here a 250 to 300 plus percent increase in bone formation on both trabecular bone and cortical bone. So a very massive and rapid effect in stimulating bone formation. Now, this is the bone turnover markers from one of the fracture trials that has compared romosozumab and placebo. And what you see is P1 and P, the marker of bone formation, and CTX, the marker of bone resorption. So initially, there is, again, this huge stimulation of bone formation and the inhibition of bone resorption, so this dual effect. And then you see that the uh, stimulation of bone formation progressively comes back to baseline so that within a year, there is no more bone formation that is stimulated, but there is still bone resorption, uh, 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 inhibition of bone resorption going on. So the effect is very massive in a few months and then levels off, 
the reason why the treatment will be given for only one year and then eventually repeated some times later. Now, this uh, effect on bone formation translates into very rapid and large changes of bone density. Seen here against placebo, one year romosozumab uh, increased the spine BMD by more than 13% and hip BMD by about 7%. Now, I would like to put this into some perspective. First of all, the effect of the romosozumab, like the effect of denosumab before, is reversible. So these again are BMD gains that hip and spine on romosozumab in green. And then the dotted line is what happens when you stop therapy. So the bone density is quickly lost. But if you then give an anti-resorptive, in this case denosumab, the bone density is not only maintained, but keeps increasing. So for that reason, the design of the fracture trials will actually be a sequence of therapy, starting with romosozumab and then followed by an anti-resorptive. Now to show you how efficient this sequence is, this is again the bone density gains at the spine in the frame study. And in that study, the women were treated with one year of romosozumab followed by one year of denosumab. And in just two years, you see that they gained more than one T-score of spine bone density. So to put that in perspective, what I show you here is the long-term gains of spine bone density with denosumab alone in the freedom extension trial. And what you can appreciate is that one year of romosozumab equals almost five years of continuous denosumab. And this short sequence of two years, romosozumab followed by denosumab is equal to seven years of continuous denosumab. So now we have an opportunity in just the couple of years where the risk of refracturing is so important to restore bone mass from osteoporosis to nearly normal levels at spine and largely also at the hip. So the next question is, is Romo really more efficient than teriparatide? And to, to start here, I want to remind you that the PTH receptor agonists of teriparatide and abeloparatide have a different mechanism of action compared to romosozumab. Yes, they stimulate bone formation because they stimulate osteoblasts, but at the same time, they stimulate bone remodeling, which means osteoclast activity. So as you know, the markers of formation and resorption, they both increase with teriparatide and abeloparatide. So this is different from Romo that increases modeling based bone formation, but at the same time inhibits resorption. So what is the most efficient in increasing bone density? So this was tested in a head-to-head -head study of romosozumab versus teriparatide in postmenopausal women who had been on bisphosphonates for many years, mostly alendronate for more than three years at least. And despite that, they kept bone density at spine or hip that was below minus 2.5. And those women had previous fractures. So this is a high risk group that is not sufficiently responding to bisphosphonates and they're randomized to Romo or teriparatide. Women are 71, two years of age. They have very low bone densities. And as I said, all of them have previous fractures. So what happens? Both drugs increase spine bone density. Teriparatide by 5.4% and romosozumab by nearly twice as much, near 10% as 
shown before from the other studies. And that is significantly more. But the difference is even more striking at the hip on more cortical sites. Why? Because as we all know, teriparatide, particularly after bisphosphonates, decreases transiently BMD at the hip. And that is due to the concomitant stimulation of bone resorption. Whereas romosozumab positively changes BMD at the hip with gains of around 3%, which is of course significantly better than the effects of teriparatide. This study was, of course, too small to evaluate fracture risk, but we know the importance of BMD and BMD changes uh, to uh, decrease uh, fracture risk. So what about the fracture trials? So I already mentioned the FRAME study. So FRAME is a very large randomized control study in more than uh, uh, 7,000 women, randomized to romosozumab or placebo for one year, and then transition sequence to denosumab, as I explained before. Now, women in this study, uh, it's important to understand that they all receive vitamin D, first of all, loading dose, and then calcium and vitamin D throughout the trial. Why? Well, all uh, osteoporosis therapy are given with calcium and vitamin D, but particularly romosozumab, because it produces new bone so quickly and massively, which is a need for calcium. And at the same time, it inhibits resorption. If you do not provide enough vitamin D and calcium, there is a risk of hypocalcemia. This treatment population was uh, 70, 71 years of age. Bone densities were around minus 2.5 or just below because that was an inclusion criteria. But fractures were not very prevalent at baseline. Actually, only 18% had a prevalent vertebral fracture. And note that the average FRAC score in this trial was around 13%. So 13% fracture risk at 10 years. So this is not a very high risk population. This is a high risk, your usual old woman with osteoporosis, but not very high risk because not all of them already had a fracture. And that is why you can compare Romo with placebo. So the primary endpoint is the reduction of vertebral fractures at 12 months and Romosozumab reduces vertebral fractures by 73% compared to placebo. But in fact, uh, a reduction is already observed after six months, which corresponds to the very rapid mode of action of romosozumab. Romosozumab also decreases the totality of clinical fractures within 12 months by 36%. And then there is a trend for a reduction in non vertebral fractures by about 25%. Now remember again, this is all within just one year of therapy. And in particular, if you look at the women in the trial who were at high risk, which is about 5,000 women whose uh, FRAX uh, was 20% or more uh, for major osteoporotic fractures, with, which means a 10 years risk of more than 20% to have a fracture. In this high-risk group, romosozumab reduced non vertebral fractures by 36% in just one year. And again, I remind you that no other therapy has shown a reduction of clinical and non vertebral fractures in such a short time frame. This recent analysis further shows the importance of selecting the women at high risk to get the maximum benefits from momosozumab. So this is the relationship between the baseline fracture risk calculated by FRAX and the risk reduction of non vertebral fractures and clinical fractures in this trial. And so when, the, again, the risk of fracture at 10 years 
gets above 20%, you see that there is more reduction of non vertebral fractures and more reduction of clinical fractures with Romosozumab. So again, a drug that is perfectly suited to target the women at highest risk. Now, there were not very many uh, differences in adverse events between placebo and romosozumab. Note, for example, that there were no differences in cardiovascular events or cardiovascular death. And there was, in fact, just one case of a typical femoral fracture and one case of osteochoris of the jaw in the romosozumab group. Now, the second major fracture trial is a head-to-head -head comparator trial between romosozumab and alendronate in high-risk women. After one year of comparison, everybody goes on alendronate for another couple of years. Again, everybody receives loads of calcium and vitamin D. Now, because this is against an active comparator, which is an approved drug for osteoporosis, this study could include women at much higher risk than the previous one. So they were older, average 74 years of age. Their T-scores were even worse, close to minus three. And by the uh, inclusion criteria, 100% of the women coming in the study had a previous fracture. So their average fracture score at baseline is 20%. So now we're really looking at the totality of a study with very high risk women. And again, romosozumab decreased vertebral fractures more efficiently this time than alendronate. So 77% more reduction of vertebral fractures by just one year of therapy. And then at 24 months, after the transition to alendronate, the benefits remained for those who started on romosozumab, who did 48% less vertebral fractures compared to alendronate alone. And this was true on all types of fractures. So in blue, those who started with romosozumab for one year, then followed by alendronate. And in orange, those who just received alendronate all along. So starting with romosozumab again, provided the 27% reduction of clinical fractures, a 20% more reduction in non vertebral fractures, a 38% reduction in hip fractures compared to alendronate. And alendronate is by itself an efficient drug. So this is better than the standard therapy. Now, the little caveat in the, in the ARCH study was a slightly but significantly higher number of cardiac ischemic events and cerebrovascular events in the romosozumab group compared to the alendronate group. And this was very surprising because in the previous larger study against placebo, romosozumab and placebo showed no differences in cardiovascular events. So this could be various uh, things, right? It could be a small adverse event of romosozumab, perhaps in women at high cardiovascular risk. It could be due to chance because there are few events, or it could be a benefit of alendronate in reducing cardiovascular risk, for example, in women with heavy cardiovascular calcification. In fact, the arch population where this slight imbalance was seen has a cardiovascular risk profile that is slightly worse than the frame study population where the difference in cardiovascular risk was not seen. So maybe it's due to the old age and high risk of these women that we saw some cardiovascular events. Maybe it's due to alendronate, because when you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves of those cardiovascular events, what is really strange here is how few cardiovascular events were recorded in the alendronate group during the first year of therapy. 
So in the end, when the FDA reviewed the totality of the data, they could not really conclude. And they said it's difficult to discern whether the increased cardiovascular risk in the study is a drug effect, a chance finding, or because of reduced risk in the allen rate group. Now, that being said, the jury is out, and we don't want to take too many risks when prescribing romosozumab to women at high fracture risk. So to avoid any cardiovascular problems, the FDA uh, recommend to not give romosozumab in women with a story, at least a recent story, of myocardial infarction or stroke. So in summary, Romosozumab is a new bone forming agent with a dual mechanism of action. Since at the same time as it is an anabolic, it has an anti-resorptive effect. It produces large and rapid increases in bone density, particularly when it is followed by denosumab. It provides a nearly immediate reduction of vertebral fractures and clinical fractures. By that, I mean within a year. It is indicated, therefore, in very high-risk patients, and particularly in those with a recent osteoporotic fracture. And it's contraindicated after a stroke or an MI. With that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be glad to take your questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Serge, for this informative uh, presentation. And uh, we will uh, see the question now, and uh, we'll ask you to answer, please. One minute. And, Doctor, can I ask a question? Hello? Hello? Yeah, I hear you. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Prof, for the informative information that you are giving us. I am an, a surgeon. Yes. Uh, my my question I have Bromo is is was introduced in our department a uh, few months ago. Also in Saudi Arabia, is still not uh, really known in the market. Now uh, my question with with all my patients, which I have mentioned in my lecture, with all these high risk factors, do you think adding additional factors of cardiac uh, incidents uh, that can happen by promo um, will encourage, encourage me to take that risk and the legal action uh, after giving the patient promo? Okay, well, first of all, uh, as I said, there is absolutely no certainty that it increases cardiovascular risk, okay? against placebo in uh, nearly 4,000 women, there was no cardiovascular risk with Romo. Just these few cases against alendronate, and we don't know if it is Romo or alendronate that had the effect, even the FDA doesn't know. Second, we need not to forget that provided we don't give it to someone who just had an MI or stroke, the risk, cardiovascular risk, is extremely small, okay? Um, the Japanese had been using Romo first in the world, I think since uh, October, even before that, of last year. They have treated nearly 100,000 patients, and from all the reports we have from Japan, this cardiovascular risk seems not to be there in the real world at all. So uh, you need then to consider the benefits and understand your legal like issues. But on another side, if you have a patient with a recent hip fracture who after six months breaks the other one and dies because of it, it's also a legal issue in a sense because we have not treated that lady properly. So of course we need to balance benefits and risks but in my view, and now with our experience, one year uh, with romosozumab in our patients, I assure you that uh, the benefits far outweigh those risks. 
provided again you don't give Romo to the very high cardiovascular risk patients. But most, uh, excuse me, most of our patients are high risk. Well, I, as I said, I didn't say high risk. I, yeah, I understand. I understand. Me, mine too. I didn't say high risk. Okay. So if you have a clear history of coronary heart disease or um, um, transient ischemic attacks, even worse, a history of MI or stroke, for the moment, it's better not to give Romo. But the patients with you know, high cardiovascular risk because they have the usual risk factors, that is not a contraindication for this therapy by no one. Thank Next you. Next question. Uh, Professor Serge, there is a question about why the drug is used for one year only. Uh, you can you could clarify this point, please. Yeah, so the, the idea to give it for one year is be, because the, 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 again, the stimulation of bone formation is so early and so potent that it becomes almost exhausted after one year. And after that, you just have the antiresorptive effect. So you can switch an antiresorptive that is cheaper. That being said, the treatment can be repeated. So there are some studies of sequence where you give romosozumab, then an antiresorptive, and then you come back with romosozumab again for one year. So that these are, it's possible to repeat, but it's better not to extend beyond one year because you've then already exhausted all the bone formation you could get from those osteoblasts at that point. And you need to system, let the system regenerate before you can stimulate again. It's an important question, thank you. Uh, what about uh, the dosage, uh, sir? So the dose is 210 to 110 milligram per month, mm -hmm. and it comes with two injector, injectors pre-filled, which go subcutaneously. So it's two injections at once, once a month, and this dose of 210 milligrams lasts for about a month, and then you renew the injection. And the only precaution is the myocardial infarction at the return. So the precaution is, again, to, to ensure uh, uh, optimal vitamin D levels, so at yes. least 30 nanograms per ml, and proper calcium intake, at least 1,000 milligrams mm -hmm. per day, and discard patients with recent MIO stroke. Thank you very much, and uh, we are pleased uh, to hear from you, and it will be not uh, the first time. It, will, it is the first time, and it will, it will be not the last. First time. Um, Virtual. Hope to see you. Uh, hope to see you in Jeddah. Uh, Thank you very soon. much again for your time. Uh, you. We are uh, saying hi to you from Saudi German Hospital Jeddah. And next time you will visit us at the hospital, inshallah. I hope Thank so. You. Great, great pleasure. So take care and, and have good a very, evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Have, have a very nice evening and thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to thank you all, all the attendees and all uh, the attendees in uh, Zoom. Uh, we reach a great number. And if there is any uh, 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 question, we could uh, feel free to, to send it again. Regarding the most of the question are about uh, the accreditation. Uh, we'll make sure that everyone who attends this Zoom meeting will have his credit out. Thank you very much and uh, hope that you enjoyed the evening with us. Thank you. Thank you.